people who are in fight, flight, or freeze for a long period of time, they actually, if they are um, asked to, like by a practitioner or assisted, or even if they try themselves to create some pathways to rest, digest, and heal, that even that is actually perceived as threatening. Hello and welcome to Finding Your Spark again. Today I have with me Allison Lighthizer. She is an alternative healthcare practitioner with inner restoration healing. And today we're going to get to talk about how to find joy using your nervous system. This is a topic dear to me, so I cannot wait to get into it with Allison. Welcome. Thanks so much for having me. I'm delighted to be here. I say it's dear to me because I feel like the world didn't really make sense to me, right? How to kind of live in the world and reach for emotions like happiness and joy and satisfaction, all these kind of wonderful things that people go like, yeah, I want that, right? Um, until I started to learn about the physicality of it, right? And so having that little bit of knowledge, uh, even though you have a lot of knowledge on it, having giving us a little bit of knowledge on what's happening in the body and how it's participating in the process, I think it's really powerful. I do too. And I think it's really, like, I feel a lot of compassion for myself when I think about it in the context of what's going on inside the brain and inside the body, that physiologic uh, baseline. If we understand it, we really, it's not like, oh, why aren't you more joyful today? <laughs> you know, It's like, okay, we got to meet a basic need here. We got to rewind a little bit and, and meet ourselves where we're at before we can move forward sometimes. Sometimes that's how it works out. <gasps> yeah. I love the way you, you described that reminds me of that feeling that we get when we uh, go in a direction we want to go for a few minutes, like a couple of days or whatever it is, right? We go, yeah. we feel better, we do the things that we want to do and we sort of reach and we, we are succeeding at it. And then we end up in this cycle where we're like back on the, in the direction you don't want to go, or we need a, a day of complete rest and we're like, what is happening here? You know, so can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, definitely. So in, in my work, we talk about the brain and how the brain has two different gears. There is fight, fight, or freeze, and that's called the sympathetic nervous system. And there is the parasympathetic nervous system, which is rest, digest, and heal. So our brain is hardwired for survival. It's not hardwired for joy. It's not hardwired for gratitude. It is hardwired for survival. So if you are in a stressed state, your body's going to be in that fight, fight, or freeze. And it is it is very hard for our primitive brain to move out of that sometimes. And basically the last two, three years, we've had unprecedented levels of stress on top of everything else. So when you think about it, like our brains are definitely fried from all the different news that we're hearing, all the different... Um, tragedies that we're experiencing worldwide. And so we're getting this feedback loop that we're always needing to be in that fight, flight, or freeze. We need to be hypervigilant because something bad is going to happen if we're not. So our brains are doing this, not because they're bad, not because they're, they don't want you to be grateful and joyful, not because they don't want you to have your spark, but because they're trying to help you survive and they're getting like a danger signal from the world. They're getting a danger signal from our life. And what starts to happen then is that we get stuck there. And when your primitive brain is stuck there, you can't really have authentic joy. You can't really have quote unquote happiness. <laughs> like when you're in survival mode, that's all there is. Like there's not, oh, let's enjoy this meal. Let's enjoy this vacation. Let's enjoy this connection. That's all in the category of rest, digest, and heal. And I love that you said sometimes you just have to rest for a full day. And we have a lot of judgments about rest. We have a lot of uh, really slave driver internal voices that, that are pushing us in and continuing us into this fight, flight, or freeze pattern. And when our brains are detecting like the deadline, the, the running around all over town, driving your kids to school or whatever, 
um, that, that feedback loop is reinforced. And so a lot of times if we want to get out of fight, flight, or freeze, if we want a more joyful, centered, balanced, restful life, we have to move into that parasympathetic, into that rest, digest, and heal place before we can discover that joy comes effortlessly and gratitude, no problem. It's not, it doesn't take like an hour to get there anymore. <laughs> yeah. There's no hard work in happiness. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Choose your, yeah. Choose your hard. I mean, right. Yeah. Yeah. So, you, you know, uh, you're reminding me. So I have these two cats and they teach me so many lessons. And because I can observe them, right, I get to kind of see what you're talking about in a way that's uh, separate from me so that I don't feel like I'm having to judge myself all the time. Right. Cause that's, we don't like that feeling. It's like, okay, right. I did something wrong. I did something right. No, you just get to see like, what does it look like when a cat is completely relaxed and what does it look like when they are outside and they're in a, a potential predatory environment and they're sleeping so that's a really interesting thing to me because I can see them. They go like, you know, they also have a lot of other things they do, right? They hunt and they do all the things, right? But so here we are, we're in our active life. We think, okay, we're in this fight or flight or freeze mode. But uh, then I see them, they want to take a break. And so they sleep, they sleep. They're not really sleeping. They're kind of half sleeping, right? They're in this like, if you come near them, they wake up, they show their, you know, head up high. If something comes near them, if a sound happens in the woods near it, right? All of those are triggers to say, it's time for you to be in fight, flight, or freeze. And I, I noticed that like they get into that mode and then because they go indoors and outdoors, they, if they're indoors and they're in a safe environment, they'll sleep like, <laughs> Like I have to check that they're breathing, like, <laughs> right. It's like, wow. Okay. I can pet you. I can like hang out by, I can do things. I can vacuum. And you're like, yeah, I do, I do not care. I am sleeping now. Right. So that difference is a really big difference in, in my business because we talk about reaching for joy. And quite often when people are in that sort of stuck position that we were talking about, that sort of outdoor cat, um, position, they feel like they have joy. They feel like, yeah, no, I, everything's fine. It's good. I, it's all right. I, I go to work. I, I laugh. Uh, you know, everything's fine. But there's a whole layer that's sort of missing, right? That balance is crucial to have in the flexibility to move between the fight, fight, or freeze and the rest, digest, and heal. I think that's what I've noticed more and more people are losing. That, that flexibility to move freely between the two, because we should. We Both modes are great. Neither one is better than the other. They're both essential for us to survive. And I love what you said, like that self-judgment piece, because that's what I feel like is so lovely about learning this, is that we that judgment can be removed. Because if we just acknowledge like, oh yeah, my brain's been perceiving threat. It's been perceiving danger. Like that's why I'm feeling my heart race. That's why I can't sleep at night. <laughs> That's why I'm not having good digestive uh, qualities because I, I am trying to keep myself alive. Like how awesome I'm so resourceful. <laughs> um, and then after a period of prolonged time in that element, um, there is that need for the reset that, that coming back into the rest, digest and heal the indoor cat getting that long, long nap. And I think sometimes people do have that when they notice their body, not necessarily asking for rest, but like demanding rest. Like I have no choice. In that. They're like, what's wrong with me? But really it's just, um, it's helping you help yourself <laughs> to <laughs> reset that, that button and, and really be able to come down from that hypervigilant state to get into a deeper sleep, to really wake up, not feeling like you were hit by a truck. <laughs> and, um, and, and, and get down from that. What, what I've been seeing actually, which is recently in the last few years is a lot more what I call co-contraction, nervous system co-contraction, where people who are in fight, fight, or freeze for a long period of time, they actually, if they are um, asked to like by a practitioner or assisted, or even if they try themselves to 
create some pathways to rest, digest, and heal, that even that is actually perceived as threatening. Like, we can't do that. We can't do that right now. Like, we, we have to stay hypervigilant. And it'll be like a pendulum swing in the other direction. So if they were having a little bit of insomnia, for example, or a little bit, bit of uh, other symptoms like fatigue, and then you try and rest and like, okay, I'm going to do this. It'll almost get worse for a while because their body's like, ah, like, I don't know what you're doing, but this is not what we've been doing. And I think we should keep doing the thing that we're doing, which is stay in, in fight, flight, or freeze. Right. I'm going to bring the outside world in, which I hardly ever do, but I feel like, um, you know, those habits that we have around watching news that is uh, sensationalized in some way, right? Either we've heard it three times already, so we, we actually don't need, it's not news, we don't need to hear it and again. Yeah. Um, of course, we have to be aware of our surroundings, but that's really different from, you know, hearing about the 17 murders that happened in 12 different states and like over and over and over again. And we kind of, those cravings that we get in our bodies to, to do that, it's like, six o'clock, it's eight o'clock, it's 11 o'clock, whatever time it is for you, our bodies go like, we should turn on the TV. Hey, we should watch the news or we should watch a shoot 'em up or right. Some, something that involves th the chemicals of the body that allow us to do the thing you just said, we, we got to stay in this space. Like you're trying to kill me, trying to make me relax. Yeah. It's powerful. So powerful. I'm glad that you said that. Yeah, I think that is, we can become so addicted to our own stress that we self-sabotage in, in a sense and do those patterns, do those behaviors that are keeping us in that cycle because our brain feels like that's a good, a good thing to do. <laughs> and long-term, it's really taxing on our bodies. And when the brain perceives stress, we were talking about what's happening physiologically. So if the brain perceives stress, then it sends a message to the adrenals and they create that's an endocrine organ and they create different messages to the body and different hormones. And one of the hormones is adrenaline, which most people have heard of. Another one's cortisol. And cortisol uh, has a big relationship with insulin, which is related to our blood sugar. But cortisol, uh, it burns muscle and stores fat. So usually that's not what we're going for. <laughs> And so for a long period of time, like I will a lot of times hear people say like, I'd love to lose weight, but I, nothing, nothing I'm doing is working. I've tried everything. And if your brain is still in that loop, it's still going to be sending signals to your adrenals. Or if you're in adrenal fatigue and you are taking supplements to support the physiology around those glands, but you're not changing the way that your brain is sending signals of threat and hypervigilance. You're not going to interrupt that loop enough to fully recover. So I think it's very important to understand what's happening on a physiologic level so that you can get to where you want to be and you can feel better and you can have the choice to reach for joy. And when we're in that survival state, we don't really have that choice. We, we, you can't be in survival mode and in like ecstasy. They're, they're mutually <laughs> exclusive. It's true. Yeah. It is true. It yeah. is true. It's hard to want to do things that are pleasurable when you feel like somebody's chasing you down to kill you. Right. You're not stopping to smell the flowers when a tiger is running after you. You know, yeah. like, oh, wow, look at that sunset. <laughs> Gorgeous colors. Keep moving. Keep moving. Come on. Keep moving. Yep. <laughs> um, I... Uh, I love that you're bringing up this part about our thought patterns because they're really a part of that story that is, is also requires some skill to, to figure out how to change them, aren't they? So the way I always think of it is like a highway, a super highway, right? It's like we were born, we soaked up all this information about how the world works and what we need to do. And then we got older enough that we started practicing those kind of uh, pathways, right? Those kinds of, uh, they're really almost subconscious thoughts, right? They're like, this is the way the world works kind of thoughts. And and those those pathways that we've worn down, they're super easy, right? You can just reach for those. And those pathways that we haven't are like dirt bike bike paths, you know, they're like 
jaggedy and I don't know. I think I'm going to fall off this cliff of thought. It's like not okay to be thinking this. My whole body wants me to think a different thought right now. <laughs> so, uh, so I love that you're bringing up that connection between like, we can do all the physical stuff and sometimes we need to do all the physical stuff, but we also have to do all the mental and emotional stuff work in order to actually get there in this long term. So talk to us a little bit about the brain and how we change our brains. How do we do that? So the work that I do, there are some brain retraining programs that are purely like um, thought-based, purely thought-based, and mine, are, mine is more like thought and um, exercise based, I guess you could say, because we're actually stimulating different parts of the body. We're using back doors to the nervous system, back doors to the brain to make it realize that it's actually okay to relax. It's okay to let go of that pattern. It's okay to choose the dirt bike path and you're safe on the dirt bike path when you're choosing those dirt bike path thoughts and you're um, stimulating your, your vagus nerve, for example, that's the, it's the 10th cranial nerve in it. A lot of people are talking about it right now because it's it has a huge, um, huge influence on our ability to get into that parasympathetic state, into that rest, digest, and heal, and stay there. So if we lose that ability to get there and stay there, and we're losing our flexibility, we can do things with our body and use the way we were designed physically to help us get to a better feeling thought, a thought that creates um, endorphins, a thought that creates, um, you know, something other than stress. So we can, we can do that physically. We can do that emotionally we can do that mentally. We're, we're mental, emotional, spiritual, physical beings. We're, we're not just, um, mental beings. We're not just physical beings. So I, I think it's really important to take a, a three, three pronged approach <laughs> to, to retraining our brain and really understanding ourselves in a different way and how different organs, different nerves, different components of our body, our breath, um, the way that we engage in habits. Like, for example, I've been talking about this recently. I've been teaching this wellness series to startup companies and they are working a lot remotely. And the first thing that they do when they wake up, and I would say the majority of us are probably guilty of this, where you're using your phone as an alarm clock and then you look at your phone first thing in the morning. You are not only is the blue light from the phone affecting your brain and it's cutting off, it's truncating like the natural way that you're waking up. So it's saying, bah, it's an emergency just by the light that you're seeing on your phone. And then the information that we're getting, the news, the posts that you're seeing that can drop us right back into that sympathetic nervous system, that fight, flight, or freeze. So when we wake up in the morning and we're getting artificial light and artificial information, it's hard for us to really know what we're feeling. <laughs> it's hard to really know like how we're doing even that day. How did we sleep? I don't even know. I just dropped myself right back into this pattern. That's not very healthy for me. So when we, when we have these behaviors or when we have these, um, rituals that we do. Like a lot of people drink coffee in the morning and that is when our cortisol, that stress hormone is the highest. And when we drink coffee on top of that, it is like an artificial high, which feels good. We like that feeling, you know, it feels great to be like, all right, I'm motivated. I'm, I'm clear headed. I can get to work. And what happens is that stress hormone goes up and all like our ability to heal ourselves goes down. Uh, the, the way that cortisol works also is it actually is like robbing a bank of tomorrow to meet the demands of today. So when we're engaging in these things that are reinforcing that fight, fight or freeze pattern, we're just continuing to get on that six lane highway towards stress <laughs> and disease rather than choosing, you said, um, a dirt bike path. And I always talk to my clients about it as like a deer path. Like you can barely see it in the grass, but the more you take it, but I love the, the, um, the precipice of the dirt bike path. I'm going to have to use that. I love it. <laughs> so we, we really do, it takes risk and it takes work to choose the deer path, choose the dirt bike path and, and to get back on it. 
over and over again because our bodies and our brains they choose the path of least resistance not necessarily the path to joy like <laughs> that is not the way we're we're wired we have to choose that we have to choose the different path i love that you're bringing up that it takes practice it takes deliberateness and it takes practice and it takes knowledge so i like to think of the body as like our space suit because i'm a sci-fi fan and uh, so I always think like, I came here in my ship. This is my ship, you know? And for me, it helps me to relate to why do I want to take care of it? And why do I want to know it? Like the engineers in those shows know those ships uh, and, and be able to say, okay, when I need power to, to run or when I need to be able to turn down the engines so that we can sit here and do something in this space i need to know how to do that right yes. those, those are not things that we were taught yeah <laughs> like nobody gave you space to instructions when you came out of your mom's womb you know what i mean so um so i think that that phys bringing that physical into the mental like how do we access that and and enhance that ability to access it with our with our body really really important yeah i love that and I, I think that's one of the ways that i like to bring healing and hope and breakthrough for people is because when we learn about our body we actually are quite set up for healing if we give it the right environment and it, you know we might have learned about like mitosis we might have learned about I don't know, ecosystems, but I don't really feel like there's ever been a great way that we've gotten information of how to support our own bodies, support our ability to eliminate and detox and get rid of stuff that we don't need anymore. Those could be emotions, thoughts, memories, toxins, chemicals. And when we don't know how to do that, they build up. We're actually exposed to between 700,000 and 2 million toxins per day. And so if we're not, we're if, uh, often we're actively toxing, we're not actively detoxing, you know, we're, we're having those beverages that maybe have some stuff in them. We're engaging in activities that are actually adding load to our body. <laughs> so there's like a pretty distorted way that we are um, perceiving self-care. I think like self-care isn't wine and Netflix. It's not alcohol and blue light <laughs> before bed. Um, that's not actually going to get you out of fight, flight, or freeze. It's just going to numb you. So it feels better in the moment, but it's not actually creating more flexibility or giving you more joy for the long term. So we've talked a little bit about how we can involve our bodies, that we need to involve our bodies in order to make those new changes in our lives. Um, can we can we just touch on how, what happens when we start to move in a direction, right? We go, okay, I am doing it. And I am, I'm doing the things that my guide has showed me to do in order to access the body properly and all the things. And we get a few days down the road or a few weeks down the road. It depends on the tolerance, right? People even talk about this in terms of all different uh, change programs, you know, exercise programs and uh, the beginning of the year and everybody's resolutions, you know, by three weeks in, there's nobody doing it anymore. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and so how do we, how do we do that? How do we come back to it every time we get off that path? Well, I think it's important to think about the way that the brain perceives change and the way that the brain perceives change, it can be a threat. Even if you're choosing like, I'm going to eat more broccoli. Like you would think that that would be a good change, but it, it can be perceived as a threat to the brain. It's threatening my ice cream habit. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. So for me, the first thing that I do with people is make sure that they can be in their body in a safe way. And that is actually really sorely lacking. People aren't comfortable in their own skin. They're not, they don't feel like their body's a safe place. So we do a lot of imagery to start with. And we do a lot of grounding uh, exercises that you do like 
multiple times a day to just kind of bring you back, bring you back. And what you're doing by the bringing back is you are saying like, it's okay to be here. You're doing great. And before you even do it, like if you were going to try and eat more broccoli, what I would do for people is um, who maybe had difficult dietary changes in the past, but they're like, I just can't do it. I don't know what it is about it. I want to, but I just can't do it is for, for whatever reason, the primitive brain is saying, no, like, I, I think I'm shutting it down. Um, if you use your imagination, the brain actually doesn't know the difference between reality and imagination. So the more detailed you can imagine, the more you can bring your senses in. It is so lovely to be able to imagine eating broccoli, like imagine how proud you are of yourself. Imagine how good you feel getting those extra nutrients, the energy you're going to have, the smile you're going to have on your face. Um, so if you kind of imagine like how you feel and you're, you're introducing the idea via the imagination and you're having a successful moment with it. So you're actually saying like, here's the dirt bike path and it's not scary. You're doing an awesome job on it <laughs> and it doesn't really matter that it's real or not real. You're, you're bridging that gap between what change is and what change isn't for you. So if you, you can imagine, and actually it's so cool. There's so many new studies around the impact that imagination has on, on the body, like muscle building and weight loss and all these things. It's, it's pretty cool, but there's a way that we can make it a safe place for us. So those first three weeks, you might be forcing yourself to do the new thing, to do the change, even though your brain's screaming at you to stop. So eventually the brain's going to win. And if you haven't like been able to create a bridge between this activity, this new thing that we're doing, we want to do that. It feels so good. We love when we do that. Um, if we're not establishing a sense of safety there, you're going to, you're going to fail. <laughs> Sadly, it's going to be another um, broken dream of New Year's Eve. It's, it's, yeah, I've had them. Everyone's had them. <laughs> so, to me, this sounds a lot like a uh, mental and emotional rehearsal. Yes. That yeah. we're, we're taking the time to have an intention and to practice before we get up and go to the refrigerator mm -hmm. to yeah. get the thing that I'm imagining, which yeah. is uh, the healthy popsicle that is not healthy, right? Is right. But am I, am at, oh, let me imagine that, that thing of broccoli or that whatever it is that would replace that. Um, so that's really powerful. That's really powerful. And uh, definitely a part, I think, of any practice to find more happiness in life. Um, you also really touched on sort of a physical explanation for willingness, right? Because willingness is essential. And it is the absolute beginning, right? You, you hear the thing on the internet or on TV or whatever, and you go, yes, I am going to be more productive. So this time I am going to get up at this time and I'm going to do these five things. And then I'm going to, you know, not go make the coffee. Um, <laughs> go make the tea. Um, and, and you have intention and you have desire but you don't actually have physical willingness. And I think putting your finger on that physical willingness is really an important thing for people to hear that there is a step, not just in life, right? Not just like, oh, in order to want that, I've got to do some work. But every single time we reach for the thing, whether it's a new habit or a new thought pattern or a new emotional pattern, right? every time we reach for it to, to allow our bodies to say, okay, this is safe to do as, you, as you've said, which I hardly ever think about the word safe. So that's really interesting, but it does open that door. It is a, a really good description of opening your doors to the possibility of willingness. Yeah. It neutralizes it for sure. I I'll share a story. I, um, I used to be quadriplegic. I used to be in a wheelchair and I had a lot of pain, a lot of like nervous system dysfunction 
and I was having seizures and organ failure and all this stuff. So it was a very intense road to recovery, but I was an athlete and I did a lot of visualizations through my competitive gymnastics and stuff. And I would imagine walking and imagine playing frisbee with my brother and stuff. And it wasn't because I was going to be like, I'm going to get ahead of this <laughs> recovery. It was totally a disassociation <laughs> tool. I was like, get me out of this body. Um, but I think it did help me in the long run. But what was happening with, um, as I was, I was very functional. I was working out again and I was, I was even training to compete on American Ninja Warrior. And this was really important because I would feel like so emotional and like angsty um, if my legs got sore or if I like w I was doing weightlifting and stuff and I just like was like what is the resistance like I don't what I don't understand why I hate this so much because <laughs> um, I love movement you know I love being strong um, and what it was is I had to actually heal some some brain patterns around if my legs feel shaky or weak that means I'm relapsing that means my legs aren't going to support me that means I'm going back in a wheelchair. So my brain was continuing to uh, associate like leg shakiness or muscle fatigue with you're going down. <laughs> and that was not, um, that wasn't safe for me. That wasn't a safe. So I had to really work on being like, Hey, this is different. It's okay. I know it feels similar, a little bit similar, but it's different. And we're actually going to get stronger from this. We're going to actually go more in the direction, but I had to really work with myself on emotional, physical, mental, spiritual level to get past that resistance and for my body to be willing to, to do it. You bring up a really nice point about bringing in the word spiritual and, um, and that talking to yourself, right? That sort of how there is something that we all define differently that is beyond our experience of the physical and mental and and emotional right it is something bigger than that and that that's a that's a place of safety that is a place that you can always go where you are essentially eternal right because you're 100 present and then your relationship to this suit and how it works, including the brain and how it's working, really can shift in these exponential ways because you've got a different vantage point. You've got a different perspective. Yeah, that is an incredible journey. And I am so glad uh, that you brought it up because I think a lot of times people look at people like you who are healthy and happy and people like me who are, you know, all into joy and sure you have a nice life, you know, um, <laughs> and I got pretty paintings and I got right. So like you kind of look at it and you go like, mm, that's not me. That's not me. They didn't come from where I came from. And to hear where, what you have healed from, right. The depth of physical disability that you've been able to say, I'm going to make a difference in this. I am going to participate in a way that makes a positive difference in my life from really far down on that scale. <laughs> <laughs> Quadriplegia is just about as bad as it ever gets, right? Yeah. And here you are today, happy, healthy, have competed in things since then, still an athlete, still an athlete, as opposed to right, a an athlete again, which I think is really important mental framing in terms of like, yes, you went through this period where you didn't, you couldn't move your arms and legs, but you were an athlete because you said, hey, I want to be throwing the Frisbee. I want to be, these. this is where I'm going. And even if it's not conscious uh, projection into that time period and be like, this is my goal, you know, which kind of puts a little resistance on it anyway. It's a place of respite, right? It's a place of where we can rest in those good dreams. Yeah. So that is really important that you, that you bring that up. Um, and I, and I really appreciate you sharing it so freely. I, I know that in your, on your webpage and things like that, it does say about, your accident. And I feel like that's a gift you give to the world, right? 
we were talking before, like, we don't have much other than our voice and our bodies. And if we don't share them, then we're not, we're not participating. We're not contributing. And I used to, I did go through a period of time where I didn't want to talk about it. And I was still in it. You know, I was still really working on my physical strength and my mental hope, like my ability to choose a better feeling thought. And so I, I had to have a period of time where I didn't talk about it because I didn't want to reinforce, <laughs> you know, and I, I don't believe that we have to be healed or done or anything like that to share our story or to, to contribute. But there was a period of time for me where I, I was like, I got to pull it in a little, <laughs> but I, I do love sharing and I, I do love talking about it because it is like a wait, 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 double take, say what? Uh, and people have, everyone has their own struggles. Everybody's trying to get better at something or overcome something. And I think it's really nice to hear stories like that where it's so drastic, like, okay, they can do it. Maybe I can do it. <laughs> it just reinforces that, that dirt bike path, you know, that we, we can do that. So sharing your story is important. Sharing your story is so worthwhile. Yeah. I feel like that thing that you just said about, um, going from, I am in it to, I have the ability to give it to the world. It's a really important distinction because so many times we get a bright idea. We get a new habit. One time I decided that I wanted to learn to crochet. And if you had ever met me ever, even once in my entire life, you'd be like, that is the least likely thing that will ever happen, you know? <laughs> and, um, and I, and I, and I said it out loud to people who know me and it was the death of it. Right. I'm probably, <laughs> I probably never would have been a crocheter. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but it, we do that with ideas, right? We get this idea of who we want to be. And we say, I don't want to be stuck in that cycle of fight and flight. I don't want to be stuck in the cycles that I've created in my relationships where yeah. there's stress and strife. I don't want to be stuck in my financial position. And all of the ways that I've been taught to do it are surrounding me in physical human form, right? <laughs> they've given me advice. They've, you know, they've lent me money. They've done all the things, right? They've participated in their fullness to your education, which brings you to this moment where you go, yeah, that's not what I'm doing. <laughs> and it doesn't really go over that well when you open your mouth before it's fully solidified. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you bring it up in terms of your physical recovery. Like I am going to be, if you had said during the period where you don't have use of your arms and legs, I am going to be lifting weights in the future. There might've been a little resistance that got piled on you and a little <laughs> doubt that got instilled in you out of love, right? Out of, they just don't want you to be disappointed, you know, yeah. all the things, right? It's yeah. not, it's not mean or anything. But that happens when we kind of bring things out too soon. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. I just was part of this collaborative book called uh, Victim to Victory. And I think there's 19, 19 authors in there. And I shared my story in there and reading some of the other things that people have gone through, all different kinds. Everyone has a story. Everyone has a story of incredible, just incredible, dire circumstances that are... Um, they, they have a choice, you know, to, to rise or to let, let it drown them. And I, all the people that were in this book were, were risers and it was incredible. It was just really powerful to, to be part of that project and be able to read their, their stories of overcoming and how they not, not, I don't think, well, I think there was maybe one other person that used the, the terms like nervous system or brain, but everybody was doing something along those lines that helped them reach for joy, help them find their spark, help them get back on the path that they wanted to go on and not the downward spiral. So it was interesting to see uh, how they came to it in different ways and different languaging. Nice. Uh, we will, of course, make sure for everyone that the link to the book is on all of the platforms where this 
recording exists. And uh, I want to just make sure that people know how to reach you as well, Allison, because I, I think your work is really important and it's great for people to be able to reach out and see if it's a good fit for them. Yeah, I'd love to connect with you. I have um, a free Facebook group called Inner Restoration that you can find me at. And there's, I, I have a free gift for people that join the group with a little guided imagery, guided meditation of how to deepen getting safety in your nervous system so that you can start making those positive changes and choosing joy. Um, I have a website that's inner-restoration.com and you can contact me there. You can um, look at my programs. I have an eight-month program for women who want to get to the next level of health, want to be able to have not just encounter feeling better, but they want to know how to do it for themselves, for their families, and they want to be able to do it again and again. They don't want to just like someone else to go fix them. They want to have the the toolbox to be able to do that. So that's what the inner restoration program is all about, is teaching teaching you how to fish, not just giving you a fish, but teaching you to fish so you can fish for your family, fish for yourself, and get to that next level of being comfortable in your own body, having fewer symptoms, and regulating your nervous system and feeling joyful, finding your spark again. Thank you. I, I want to remind everybody, of course, that there is on my website at donalyn.blog, which of course, all the websites are links, right? So nobody has to worry about that. Nobody has to go typing. We can just go click the link um, for, for all of Allison's things and mine. So if you go to donalyn.blog, you can find uh, a joy quiz that will give you a sense of, first of all, it's fun because I'm into that. And uh, it's also, it will give you a sense of like, where am I? Where am I? What am I doing? Where, where do I sit? And also a pathway forward, right? The outcomes that are available, depending on uh, how you fill that quiz out, really give you, they speak to that roadmap concept of like, how, like, how am I going to get from where I am on the map to where I want to go on the map? And, um, and then, of course, if you'd like to do the in-depth joy application, you're welcome to do that at joyousonpurpose.com. So thank you so much for being here today. It has just been educational and a joy. Thanks so much for having me. I, I love it. Just, I loved being with you. And I joy is such a it's such a high level goal and road and I love that you're talking about it. So thank you. Thanks for sharing that message and holding that banner.